Welcome to Politics Nation. I'm Al Sharpton. Tonight's lead, the shooting death of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin is sparking a national outcry for justice. Three weeks ago, the high school junior was shot and killed walking back to his father's girlfriend's house in a gated community near Orlando. But still, there's been no arrest, even though the police know who shot him. George Zimmerman, the Neighborhood Watch captain, says he shot the teen in self-defense. But the young man was not armed. He was going back home after buying an iced tea and Skillet's candy. In a minute, we'll talk with Trayvon's father and family lawyer, and we'll get a live report from the scene. But first, the police have now finally released the 911 tapes in the case. And they paint a shocking, heartbreaking picture of what happened the rainy night of February 26. And they cry out for justice to be done in this case. Here's the call that George Zimmerman, the shooter, made to police. Sanford Police Department. Hey, we've had some break-ins in my neighborhood, and there's a real suspicious guy. This guy looks like he's up to no good, or he's on drugs or something. And this guy, is he white, black, or Hispanic? This guy has hand in his waistband. And he's a black male. Did you see what he was wearing? Yeah, a dark hoodie, like a gray hoodie, and either jeans or sweatpants and white tennis shoes. He's here now. He was just staring. Oh, he was just walking he's around the area. at all the houses. Up to no good. Looks like he's on drugs or something. Trayvon was just walking home from the store. He was carrying candy, not drugs. But Zimmerman decided he was suspicious. Here's what happened next. Something's wrong with him. Yeah, he's coming to check me out. He's got something in his hands. I don't know what his deal is. Okay, just let me know if he does anything, okay? They always get away. Are you following him? Yeah. Okay, we don't need you to do that. Zimmerman follows Trayvon even after police told him not to. This self-appointed neighborhood watch leader takes matters into his own hands. Then came this chilling, frantic call from someone who heard yelling and a gunshot. 911, do you need police, fire, medical? Um, maybe both. I'm not sure. There's just someone screaming outside. And is it a male or female? It sounds like a male. And you don't know why? I don't know why I think they're yelling help, but I don't know. Just send someone quick, say stop. Okay. Does he look hurt? Do you think he I can't see him. I don't want to go out there. I don't know what's going on. So they're sending. So you think he's yelling help? Yes. All right. What is your number? Just there's gunshots. You just heard gunshots? Yes. How many? This one. Jimmy, get down. No, come here. Is he no longer yelling? No one, I don't know. Help me, help me. That's tough to hear. And more panicked neighborhoods calling for help. They're wrestling right in the back of my porch. You just heard one shot go off? I was either that or a rock at the at the window or something. I don't know. The guy's yelling help, and I'm not going out. Somebody yelling for help? Um, I'm pretty sure the guy's dead out here. Holy s***. Okay. Um, and there's a black guy down that looks like he's been shot and he's dead. There's someone screaming. I just heard gunshot. Okay. Do you see anything? I don't need you to go outside, but do you see anything? Do you hear... Squealing of tires or anything? No, like, hurry up. They're right outside my house. Okay. Okay, we have p police come in emergency, okay? Are you, sorry, in, sorry, sorry, are you in San Did you see the person who had the gun? No, I just heard a loud gunshot oh, okay. sound and then the screaming stuff. Okay, we do have multiple officers in the area right now. Someone's on the ground. No name calling, no incendiary language, just the facts. A young man dead. 
The assailant says self-defense. What is found on the young man, skillets and iced tea. Probable cause for an arrest. The assailant told don't follow him. He decides to follow him anyhow. He's not law enforcement. He's not uniform. He has no legal authority or right to intervene or interfere. Why has he not been arrested? We're coming from around the country this Thursday to Sanford, Florida, to stand together. Michael Bazin of Radio, Joe Madison, myself, Nash Action Network. This family has only asked for justice. They've not called anybody names. They've acted in a dignified way. They deserve this nation's support, and we're coming to give it to them. Joining me live from Sanford, Florida, is NBC News correspondent Lilia Luciano. Lilia, uh, where does the case stand tonight? Well, as we know, Reverend Sharpton, local police have stated that they could not find enough evidence to issue an arrest. So they handed the case over to the state attorney's office. Now they're conducting their own investigation, and it's up to the state attorney, along with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, to determine whether to file an arrest, not to do so, or to hand the case over to a grand jury. Well, what evidence do they need to make an arrest? Well, they need to prove that this was not self-defense, and that's what they are evaluating now. Of course, the state attorney's office is not commenting on an ongoing investigation. That's their policy. Neither are they saying how long will their investigation take, how long they'll take to complete it. Uh, Well, again, I would differ with that. Uh, They don't have to prove anything. They have to have probable cause. But uh, let, let me ask you this. There was a stand for justice rally today by some local law students. Uh, what are you seeing in the community down there? Well, that's right. Today it was uh, very impressive. We had uh, from 75 to 100 students, many if not most of them law students from universities around the state of Florida demanding an immediate arrest. I spoke to one of those students and she told me that the state attorney, the assistant state attorney was able to welcome a few of them, four of them into his office. He heard their concerns. I was also receiving confirmation from the state attorney's office that indeed this happened and that they are listening to their concerns, but they're not releasing any information while their investigation continues. Of course, we're also hearing uh, pressure from other community leaders, from local politicians. A uh, local congresswoman has been demanding that the Department of Justice be involved, that they initiate their own investigation. Now, the uh, Congressional Black Caucus is also joined in demanding an investigation from the Department of Justice, but the Department of Justice has not began that investigation. They have not said that they will do so, not in the coming time. Their community relations service will hold the meeting tomorrow. That is not an investigating body. So rising tension here, especially to get the federal authorities and federal agencies involved. Well, thank you, uh, 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 Lilia. Uh, Let me bring in now, joining me now is Jonathan Capehart, writer for The Washington Post, who has just written a powerful column on this case today. Uh, Jonathan, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, Nash Action Network, other civil rights groups, we're calling on federal intervention and we're calling on immediate arrest. One of the things that is disturbing to me and you raise is you, the, the police are not a judge and a jury. They only determine if there's probable cause to make an arrest. If you have a young man dead and you have no evidence at all that this young man did anything wrong, then why, what are they waiting on to make an arrest? This seems pretty uh, uh, strange, if not suspicious to me. Well, it is strange. Uh, one of the things about this case, how is it possible that a young man could be shot, killed, and the, uh, and the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator, is allowed to talk to the police and then is set free? Um, he has moved out of his home. Uh, publicly, no one knows where he is, and a lot of things that police, I understand, usually do during situations like this, drug and alcohol testing and more extensive interviewing, was never done. And the police have accepted uh, George Zimmerman's um, story 
and let him go. Which that's makes the, thing the that's police th really take the place of a, of a jury and a judge. I mean, there's clearly a case here that there's no doubt the young man was killed. There's no doubt even by Zimmerman's admission that he did it. And there's no doubt that he was not under life extenuating circumstances unless uh, IT and skillets are considered a threat. So, I right, mean, it seems to me the police had more than enough to go with if they were looking to proceed. Right. But here's the crazy thing about Florida law, this stand your ground law, which is very, very broad. It allows people to defend themselves, to claim self-defense if they feel they were in danger. And so, you know, George Zimmerman could say to the police that he felt he, he was in danger, uh, pulled the trigger. And as we have seen, he did that. Apparently he said that to the police. And now he is not in jail. He is not answering to law enforcement. And quite frankly, I think it's, it's rather offensive that law enforcement isn't saying, isn't talking publicly about this case to, at a minimum, make sure that people who are very, very concerned about this, very, very concerned about what happened to Trayvon Martin, have the information have the information that they at least can possibly give out. Well, the other thing, Jonathan, on the Stand Your Ground case, and I certainly think, and we'll be dealing with this uh, Thursday at the rally and going forward, that that law has to be challenged and examined. But even if you go by that law, uh, uh, where it says that anyone not committing a crime can use deadly force if he feels threatened by death or great bodily harm, mm -hmm. once you hear the tape, Two things are uh, glaring in the 911 tapes. One, he was told, Zimmerman, not mm -hmm. to pursue the guy. Second, he said that he was following the guy. So if he right. was following Trayvon, how could he feel he was under threat? He was pursuing Trayvon. Trayvon was not pursuing him. Right. He was pursuing him and pursuing him with a nine millimeter weapon and 100 uh, pounds heavier than him. By the exactly. Way. Trayvon is a seven, is seven was a 17 year old um, young kid. George Zimmerman is 28 years old, um, I guess, head of the neighborhood watch program, a person who called the Sanford Police Department 46 times since January 1st, 2011. Um, this is a, a person, by all accounts that I have read, was someone who viewed himself as sort of a proxy cop. Well, he also and, someone that had a record. Did he not have been, uh, right. have been charged Assaulting before? Assaulting a police officer, yes. So he, he wanted to be a policeman, but he himself assaulted a police officer uh, in the past. And the young man that has been killed has no record. Right, exactly. Um, w one of the stories from the Orlando Sun Sentinel had a, a, you know, a terrific description of, of Trayvon from his English teacher, who said that Trayvon Martin was an, was an A and B student who majored in cheerfulness. How does someone who majors in cheerfulness Parents or father. threaten someone who's 100 pounds heavier than he is, 11 years older than he is, and who's carrying a nine millimeter weapon. All right, Jonathan Capot, thank you for your time the next, tonight. Thanks, next, the family of Trayvon Martin. What are they saying? We'll talk with his father live. That's next.